And uh, welcome to the second edition of BOE's uh, Talks in Politics, Dardasha Fisiasa, where we invite the big minds in political theory and practice to come and share with us their views on and analysis of local and global events. Our speaker today is none other than Professor Robert Cohen of Princeton University. Now, Robert needs no introduction. Just mentioning the name Robert Cohen is enough to raise attention and respect. He is one of the most influential thinkers in the field of international relations. He is one of the founding fathers of modern day neoliberalism. And he is the author of numerous internationally renowned books and academic papers, such as his great work, Power and Interdependence, and his other magnum opus, After Hegemony, in addition to other numerous books and academic papers. His influence in the field cannot be overstated. Today, Professor Cohen will share with us his views on the international politics of climate change, with some focus on the recent climate legislations in the United States of America. And what a timely discussion it is. Again, climate change needs no introduction. Most people on the planet agree that climate change is the greatest threat of our time and has been elevated to the level of national, economic, and human security. Uh, before we begin, we would like to thank Dr. Wadouda Badron, Dean of the Faculty of Business Administration, Economics and Political Science, for her support of events like these. She is here with us today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wadouda. We would also like to thank Dr. Amani Khudir, Head of the Political Science Department at BUE, for her supporting and leading of this event. She is also here with us now. Thank you, Dr. Amani. We would also like to thank the staff members and teaching assistants of the Political Science Department who have helped make this event come to light. Finally, and most importantly, we would like to thank our students, our young and bright minds. They were very enthusiastic for this event and they worked hard on following Professor Cohen's work and on coming up with provocative and thoughtful questions to Professor Cohen. And we have sent these questions to Professor Cohen a few days ago in addition to the questions which we will have in the Q&A session at the end of today's event. And now on to today's event, Professor Cohen will start speaking where he will give us his views on climate politics internationally and in the United States, followed by his answers to some of the questions which our BUE students have sent him. After that, we will have about 30 minutes for a general Q&A session and an open discussion where we can all participate. So please mute your microphones while Professor Cohen is speaking. And if you have any questions, then please wait until the Q&A session starts. So uh, Robert, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mahdi. It, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks, thanks to the students for, uh, for their questions and, and for inviting me. You, oh, excuse me. Excuse me, you pronounce my, my name very well, but I, I pronounce it Cohan. I mean, you're, you're quite close, much closer than most people are. Uh, but I, I pronounce it Cohan as if there were no ease at all. Uh, now, as, as Dr. Dr. Mahdi said, I'm going to give a short, maybe 15 minute lecture to talk about the politics of climate change and especially to focus on some of the recent developments in the United States which may not be as clear to you, uh, even having read the literature because there are delays in the reports. And, and, and then I wanna to respond to some of your very good questions, which you posed be beforehand. And then as, the, as, as, as Dr. Mahdi said, um, we will have an open uh, question and answer discussion section. So first, let me say a few words about the politics of climate change. Uh, although the existential dangers to humanity, <clears throat> and the natural world of climate change are enormous. Governments, individuals, and firms have responded slowly. Uh, we, we know a lot about climate change now. We, lo we know a lot about how dangerous it is, but the action from governments has been much less impressive than the work by the scientists. Uh, the world in, in, in 2014 was headed for a 3.7 degree global warming in Celsius terms, uh, now it's headed for something like 2.4 degrees, which is way above the 1.5 degrees that scientists say is the point at which irreversible and severe damage to the global ecosystem will occur. 
we're already seeing damage to the global ecosystem and we'll see damage at 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if it gets much above that, we're gonna see serious, severe and, and irreversible damage to the system. So I see two possible scenarios for the second half of this century, the, the time in which the students on this fall will, will be living their maturity. Uh, and the ultimate outcome may be a combination of these two, but I'm going to oppose these two these uh, these two opposite scenarios. The first is that there be failure to respond in a serious and radical way to climate change. That will ensure a, a climate crisis. Arctic sea ice is already thinning. If the Greenland ice sheet collapses, sea levels may rise two to three feet this century which threatens al almost all major cities, and I'm sure it threatens much of Egypt. Uh, methane release from, from permafrost uh, could lead to even more rapid warming and a runaway disaster that human beings could not manage. Because if you had methane uh, released from permafrost, that would have a positive feedback effect that would generate more warming, more methane release, and it could be a runaway disastrous problem. And so, uh, so not non-response to climate change, implies a really certain disaster for the globe and, and not just humans for for other other species also so that's there's a lot of uncertainty about the details of climate change there's very little uncertainty about the proposition that if human beings do not change their behavior and drastically reduce and eventually in not too long eliminate emissions net net emissions of greenhouse gases there will be ir irreversible damage that will affect the lives of every human being on the planet. Uh, the second point I want to make, uh, the, uh, the second alternative, is that is the alternative of responding effectively to the climate crisis. That's what I want to talk about today. I think most of us are aware of the first point. We have to do something. The, the, uh, the, tough, the tough question to ask analytically is, what are the consequences of what we do? How will we... Uh, uh, create a new industrial economy, uh, which, which does not generate climate change? Uh, and what will the features of, of that economy be? And what do we have to achieve to get there? So if we have to get there, I want to have some idea of what that entails. So this is the, the scenario I want to discuss with, with you today. If response means, if responding means net zero carbonization by 2050, what does this imply for the political economy of the second half of this century? So I'm, I'm starting in this talk with a premise. The premise is that the world will respond to the climate crisis by achieving climate, climate neutrality. That is not a claim, that is not a prediction. I'm afraid we won't do it and we'll have a disastrous result. But let's say, suppose we do rise to, to the occasion. What does the political economy of that uh, of the world look like under those conditions. So I want to talk about uh, uh, the, first about the enduring realities of the political economy of, of, of climate change, and then specifically about the United States. <clears throat> a, a clean, cool atmosphere is a common property resource in the sense that is you, you may be familiar with. That, that is, no one has an incentive to act individually in a costly way to preserve it. <clears throat> and it's depletable with use. As a result, preventing dangerous anthropogenic climate change will not occur as a result of market-led forces. It, it requires government action. People don't have an incentive to limit their emissions because each of our emissions is a very small part of the total and it won't affect us how much we emit ourselves. It'll only affect us how much we collectively emit so it has to be some collective way to limit our emissions. Secondly, fossil fuel firms and, and communities, such, such as communities that, that, that produce oil and gas and coal, will resist climate action. So po climate politics is distributional politics. It's not consensual. It's not that we're all gonna say kumbaya and get together and do this. A lot of firms and people will have incentives not to act. And, and for the opponents, of climate change action, such as the fossil fuel companies, this is existential. We can't solve this problem unless ExxonMobil goes bankrupt. And ExxonMobil doesn't want to go bankrupt. 
So this is not a, a, a consensus politics. It's a tough distributional politics. So political action is needed. Third point is that network lock-in is a problem. By network lock-in, uh, I mean that in, in many situations, all parts of a network have to change for anything to change. For, if, for example, take electric charging stations. There's no point in buying a, an electric vehicle if there are no charging stations. So you have to have a complete network of charging stations before it makes sense to buy an electric vehicle. Uh, but you, but uh, but you don't get the charging stations uh, out of market demand because nobody has electric cars, so so you never start. So something somehow you have to break into the network lock-in problem, uh, and that also also requires government action. And now once adjustment costs have been have been imposed, once you have, for example, either a carbon tax or some sort of legislation that 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 taxes people for infrastructure, as as in the United States. Uh, corporate actors are very adaptable. The problem, in my view, is not that, that, that corporations won't act. If, when they have incentives to act, they'll act very quickly. They'll act more effectively than government. Uh, and in, in the U.S., you're seeing this now in a, in, in a variety of ways, innovation uh, and, and adaption, um, adaptation to the new legislation. Um, so when incentives are clear and outcomes are predictable, Corporate strategies will adjust as long as they can make profits from, uh, from doing it. And government action, fifthly, can take various forms, including direct regulation of polluting resources, putting a price on climate change emissions, and government investment in low carbon infrastructure. Uh, so pricing carbon is one, is one strategy, but it's not the only strategy. And we don't have to put all our chips on that if that strategy is, as in the United States, not politically viable and not acceptable. So the key question about policy is, does it create strong incentives for industry and individuals to act? And does it create an, an enabling environment for corporations and entrepreneurs uh, that want to take effective action? And does it create a level playing field so that they are not disadvantaged in taking action? That's the key question. Now the US, <clears throat> I couldn't have said this a year ago, I'm happy to be able to say this now. The U.S. has become a climate leader. The Biden administration, unlike the Trump administration, recognizes the key changes in the U.S. industrial economy that will be necessary to achieve climate neutrality. And the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 is an odd, odd name for it. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act because the, the administration and, and the sponsors were afraid to put climate change in it. But it's really the Climate Change Act. Uh, and it's going to do a number of things. It's going to it's going to finance a new and vastly expanded grid, well enough to electrify the whole uh, the whole economy, and, and and to increase and to make a lot of things that are now run by gas and oil, like the heat in the building I'm I'm sitting in, electric and and, and linked to the grid. And once you have a expanded grid, you can vastly increase renewable energy led by solar and wind. And one of the key points here, and you probably already know this, you're in a sunny country, is that solar energy is now cheaper than coal and oil. So the problem is not the amount of energy. We have plenty of energy. The sun provides plenty of energy. There is no shortage of energy uh, for the human race. Uh, the problem is uh, generating renewable energy and getting it to people in the right way and changing our, uh, our vehicles, especially, and, and our heating systems uh, so that uh, they run on electric uh, grid energy as opposed to on, on, on fossil fuel. Um, there is uh, lots of innovation which is being, is, being, is being financed by this new act of battery technology. China is leading the way, but the US is now uh, uh, financing lots of battery plants. In, in the United States, which are financed by, by this uh, act. And finally, there's a lot of research and development at an earlier stage of non-carbon liquid fuels. Uh, so for example, airplanes, probably not possible, at least not in, in, the, in the current technology or foreseeable technology close to fly airplanes with, with battery technology. The batteries are too heavy. Uh, so we have to have some sort of non some sort of liquid fuel 
But if it's carbon liquid fuel, then of course it's generating uh, climate change. So we have to develop some hydrogen fuel or other non, non-carbon liquid fuel. And that, that technology is advancing pretty fast and it's being financed uh, by this bill. So I think the IRA, I've called the IRA, <clears throat> the Inflation Reduction Act. So the IRA plus other measures will contribute to a transformation of the auto industry, um, shifting to electric vehicles. Uh, last month, the Biden administration announced a rule that if implemented, would require two thirds of new passenger cars and one quarter of heavy trucks to be all electric in the United States by 2032. That's only nine years from now. The life of a, of, of a car is longer than that. So you're talking about very rapid change, which is put in industrial change in the biggest industry in the United States, at least as of, as of 30 years ago, was by far the biggest industry in the United States, the, uh, 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 the auto industry. And we're also seeing transformation of heavy industry. Right now, cement, aluminum, other metals uh, generate uh, 15 to 20% of global uh, carbon emissions. They're very high carbon activities. And there's now equity fundraising going on by Wallenberg and Merck interests to create a carbon-free steel plant uh, run by hydropower in Northern Sweden. There's a lot of technology which is, which is taking place. So my view is that the problem is not is neither the availability of energy, nor is the problem technological backwardness, because we are advancing rapidly technologically. Uh, on once once the incentives are there, um, capitalist industry is very good at develop at developing new new technology. Uh, so I, I think decarbonization can be accomplished. The problem is going to be political. The very big adjustments, uh, very big changes in habits, very big change and changes in costs. And some groups like those groups that depend on fossil fuel firms will be hurt and they will fight it. So we will have a, a distributional struggle where there are winners and there are losers from climate change action. The losers will drag their feet. And it's always easier, at least in democracies, for losers to stop things and for the people who want to change things to change things. So it's going to be a lot of difficulty. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be largely, in my view, a political struggle. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's not going to depend on um, technological change. I think we're going to get that, we're going to get that change. I'm an optimist about, about technology um, and we're likely to get it pretty fast. Uh, we're going to have lots of lots of potential solar power. Now uh, the question is changing our industrial structure and changing our ways of life in such a way which will be inconvenient uh, in some in some ways costly. Uh, will make certain uh, uh, groups and actors worse off. Um, it, it's it's making that adjustment. Uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, one one favorite one. A uh, political scientist some some years ago said uh, that uh, power is the ability not to have to adjust to change. People don't like to adjust to change. People and groups in powerful positions will attempt to push the burden of change onto others, and that's going to mean a lot of struggle. So it's the the outcome is not foreordained, but we can do it. It's quite feasible to do it. So there's a path there if we take it. Okay, that was, those are my general comments for 15 minutes. And now I wanna comment on some of your very good questions. And I, I basically selected questions that I thought were most di- directly on the topic of, of, of climate change uh, and of what we can, what we can do about it uh, and what the international politics of it are, um, what the, what the, International and domestic politics. So, so the first the first question is question one, appropriately enough. And you said, with regards to Professor Cohen's article with uh, uh, Professor David G. Victor, um, uh, the following question: Considering that each country develops its own nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, under the Paris Agreement of 2015. Where does the Paris Agreement fall on the spectrum of comprehensive international regulatory institutions, uh, that is, regime complex of the of the regime complex 
um, spectrum. <laughs> and how effective in comparison with prior dysfunctional uh, UNFCCC arrangements uh, do I, I anticipate that the Paris Agreement will be? Well, my answer to that question is pretty straightforward. The Paris Agreement is, sets up a regime complex and it fits perfectly as a, as a regime complex. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a hierarchical regime, it's not centralized. Um, it does give, as regime complexes do, a set of uh, norms and, and, and principles and, and some rules, but the rules aren't enforceable from any centralized uh, place. Uh, their guidance, ra their guidance rather than, rather than um, enforceable rules. Uh, it provides a common procedural framework for regular review and accountability. So it almost perfectly fits the notion that that, the, uh, that Victor and I put together five years earlier of what a regime complex is. Um, and the annual COPs, the, the the conferences of parties, are focal points for. which is a real change, or at least appears to be a change and improvement in their policy. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors here, but they do have an incentive every year before the cop to, sit, to, to say, look here, we're doing something. So it does make, make for certain kinds of accountability and certain kinds of normative social pressure to act. So it, it, it's positive uh, in that way. But <clears throat> notice that the real action is domestic. There's no coercion through the system. So there's no hierarchy, no secretary that says to the United States, you have to do X or even to Egypt, you have to do X, Y, and Z by next, uh, by next October. Um, uh, and uh, governments uh, have to make the commitments themselves and they can interpret their own commitments. So the NDCs are, are both uh, self-proclaimed and vague uh, and they can, make specific commitments or they can make very general commitments. So a lot of, there's a lot of scope for them. So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of weak regime complex. Um, and better than nothing, I'm, I'm, a fa I'm a supporter of the Paris Agreement. I wouldn't say I'm a fan of the Paris Agreement because it's, it's, it's pretty weak. It's the best they could do. I'm not, I'm not critical of the negotiators who try to do it, but <clears throat> there were a lot of best interests that said, no, no, we're not gonna make this commitment. We're not going to agree to that. We're not going to make irreversible commitments, which we would have to break or, or else uh, take, take costly action. It isn't like Kyoto, where governments made firm commitments for uh, percentage reductions uh, in emissions, and then in many cases broke them because they weren't willing to do it. Canada broke theirs and, 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 and walked out of the agreement, for example, or the United States refused to make the commitments because they were binding, they were binding. <clears throat> so that's what I say, what I say, say about Paris. It's a step down from Kyoto, but it was a necessary step down. And it reflects the, both the general normative view that we need to do something and the weakness of commitment to doing a lot. <clears throat> now, um, I, uh, you asked about the US role as a climate leader or laggard, but I've talked about that uh, in a, a few minutes ago. Uh, questions 2 and 15 are about U.S. climate leadership. Um, and question 2, you said, uh, building on Professor Cohen's argument that the U.S. is a, but not the, climate leader, to what extent will the bottom-up approach, approach of the Paris Agreements in D.C.'s weaken the U.S. status quo as a prominent actor in international climate politics, given Trump's withdrawal from the agreement in 2017, then Biden rejoining again in 2021. Uh, will the bottom-up approach decrease the U.S. ability to take the lead in climate politics? And question 15, which I link with this, is regarding the U.S. green transition and how its costs would not be high, to what extent is this comparable to the experience of Europe's transition from industrialization to becoming a climate leader? Uh, Moreover, please elaborate on the reasons why, even though the United States has the potential to be the world's climate leader, it is not. <clears throat> well, I think that now the U.S. is once again the world's climate 
that won't continue if, if Donald Trump is elected again in, in, in 24, uh, 2024. But if we continue with, uh, with the democratic governance, with, with the rule of a democratic party in, in the United States, uh, <clears throat> then the US will keep being the climate leader because the Democrats are committed to climate issues. It's very striking in the United States how stark the divide is between the parties and between the constituents of the parties on climate. <clears throat> the Republicans think that climate is not important. They're still supporting fossil fuels. Uh, they're still committed to the old industrial economy. And, and the Democrats have now become, after taking maybe 15 years for this to happen, uh, strongly committed to a pro-climate politics. And climate is one of the most important uh, motivating forces for the Democratic electorate. I don't think you could be elected, you could be nominated in, in most Democratic districts as a candidate for the for, for uh, Congress or the Senate if you were a climate, if you weren't strong, not only not a climate denier, but a strong supporter of climate change action. Uh, so uh, basically the US will be, will be the climate leader as long as the Democratic Party controls the United States government. Uh, if, if the Republicans control the United States government, the US will not be a climate leader. And that just reveals how important domestic politics is here. Domestic politics is 90% of the action. What really is determining is what each government is committed to doing because of the combination of the principles, the values, the views of government leaders <clears throat> and the incentives they have given their political system, whether it's a democracy or not, the incentives they have to take climate action. So quite, uh, that takes me to question 12, <clears throat> which is about domestic politics. Um, the question is, uh, you, Mention the role of domestic politics in determining the foreign environmental policies of the state. <laughs> so please tell us more about the role of green parties in particular. To what extent can they have a role among other domestic actors who are pressing lobbying for their own agendas? Now, my answer about green party is, green party is you, probably under, you probably understand this. If you sort of compare it to politics, you understand that there are only green parties in certain kinds of political systems. There are green parties in parliamentary systems with multi-member districts and typically with proportional representation. Uh, and the reason is that in those systems, a party which has 10 to 15 to 20% of the vote can be very important in the political system. It elects representatives. These representatives are often uh, in, a, in a swing position. They, they hold the balance of power between conservative and socialist or radical parties. And they are therefore important, uh, uh, important political players. They can therefore leverage their decision to support either the conservatives or the uh, left on other issues in return for uh, their partners' uh, support for their positions on environmental issues. That's not the case in presidential systems when you have typically as in, in the United States and Britain, single member districts with first past the post, because then green parties <clears throat> don't get may, very many seats, if any seats, because they're shut, if they have 15, 20%, they're shut out. So, and, and, and then the voters who might vote green have an incentive to, to vote democratic, for example, or, or, or vote labor or, or conservative because they know they'll waste their vote if they vote green. So the, it, it critically depends on the nature of the electoral system. It's multi-member districts, proportional representation in the current world generate parliaments to have green parties. They also have radical right-wing parties too, right? The same applies to them. They may have 10, 12% of the vote and, and they, they get seated in multi-member district uh, 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 systems, but not in presidential first-past-the-post systems. So that's the, that's the critical one. And, but I wanna broaden the question and, uh, and, and basically say that, uh, make the point that domestic politics is more important right now than international negotiations. It's, they're more important because only when governments have serious policies, which they're committed to and willing to put real resources behind, 
Is there going to be action? And is there anything worth negotiating about? So we have to, if I'm, if I'm emphasizing what to do, I'm emphasizing we have to generate the political um, So question 13 <clears throat> was an interesting question. Uh, it was, there are winners and losers in the issue of climate change. Please tell us which states are the winners and which states are the losers. Is it expected that as at some point in time, the winners will also become losers since climate change has, re has reached an irreversible point? Well, uh, the, the last sentence of the question tips off my answer. I think in the long run, there are very few winners from climate change. Because think of it this way, uh, we human beings have had 12,000 years to adapt to the Holocene, that is the current climate um, arrangements. The climate hasn't always been this way in the world, but the last 12,000 years has been fairly consistent and we've adapt we human beings have adapted to it. So everything that we have built uh, and the agricultural systems and the other systems we've built have been built to fit the current Holocene conditions. Um, and if we had had different conditions, we'd have to, we'd have different institutions as 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 a, as, as, as a species. Uh, so uh, when you have rapid change, it's bound to cause problems because we've already built to a certain uh, set of conditions, and rapid change means a different set of conditions. And right now, climate change is most serious in the Arctic. Climate change is, is fastest in the Arctic. It wasn't necessarily predicted that way, but it has turned out that way. Um, and, 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 there, and it's very serious for countries with low-lying sea coasts, and that must include Egypt, and in tropical areas. Those are the, those are the, are the countries that are, which of course include island states, which are the most vulnerable to climate change, which we'll, we'll see the results first. It may be least serious for countries such as Canada and Russia, continental countries lying uh, toward, toward the Arctic, but not, but not there, uh, except for their Arctic regions. You might, it, it might be that the Great Plains of Russia and Canada will benefit agriculturally, at least in the short run. Uh, so they're probably the least affected. But the trop tropical countries, tropical Africa, countries with extensive and low sea coasts and Arctic regions themselves um, will have the most serious change. And they're going to be affected. Uh, they're going to be the big losers first. Now, question uh, three and question 14 are about the global south and about aid to developing states. And uh, the question three is, according, according to professors, uh, Professor Cohen's argument that the Paris, this is my piece with Michael Oppenheimer, that the Paris Agreement maneuvered around the realities of climate change policy using discretion, quote, discretion and vagueness. Right. What are some possible recommendations that the Paris Agreement can do to better address these realities, notably those of the North-South gap in climate policy? Given that it should simultaneously aim to better incorporate the global south in climate policy and adhering to the principles of common but differentiated uh, responsibility, respective capabilities. Question 14 is, to what extent does the aid provided to developing states, especially in events such as COP27, really contribute or can, can contribute to a positive change in developing states since the aid also comes with it disadvantage? Uh, well, we, we, we know, uh, on that last point, uh, we know that there are limitations, very severe limitations of uh, aid from rich countries to poor countries. Um, one is that doesn't happen in nearly the quantity that the reports always call for. And secondly, it often, when it occurs, it's often dysfunctional. Not always dysfunctional, but it can distort and easily distort the political economy of, of the recipient countries. It can, it can channel the money to the wrong, to the wrong people in a kind of corrupt, uh, corrupt bargain. Uh, 
uh, it can support a whole aid industry, uh, which is uh, in a sense parasitical on, on the poor country. Uh, so, and in general, it, it's just not very likely to be forthcoming because it requires essentially generosity from the, the rich to the poor, and you don't see much generosity in world politics. You see a lot of self-interest and not much generosity. So I don't think we should ever expect this to be the solution to climate change. Uh, Egyptian policy, in my view, uh, should focus on innovation, not on uh, subsidies from outside. Egyptian policy should ask how Egypt can benefit from the innovation that is coming, because there's a lot of innovation coming. Uh, and it's gonna be starting mostly in the rich countries. How can Egypt adapt those innovations or, or, or create new innovations of its own, which will both jumpstart industry in Egypt uh, and help, help with climate change? Are there, is it, are there any of you who are inventors or potentially have ideas about ways in which um, Egyptian developed technology could be appropriate and adapted for uh, Egyptian responses to climate change. I, I think about that more than I would think about, gee, how do we pry another $3 billion out of the reluctant uh, North? The questions five and six are, are, are about theory. And they're, they're the last ones. And I'm gonna <clears throat> open it up and let you ask questions. So think about the questions you wanna ask after this. <laughs> So question five is, someone asked you in your talk, that must have been the, the, uh, the talk in Poland uh, or to the Polish students, about the best theory to explain climate change. And you said there should not be one theory to explain climate change. That should be a toolkit of theories. And that you actually use all three theories of IR, neoliberalism, realism, and ideational theories. Uh, John Mearsheimer said in his book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, um, um, that, that, that he used an analogy. He said the world is like, is like a room. And, uh, uh, excuse me, just a minute. And IR theory is like, is like a light in the room. The light should be strong enough to enlighten most of the room, but there will be small corners in the room where the light cannot reach, such as under a chair or behind a closet. The same applies to a good IR theory, um, as a good theory should explain the vast majority of global events but there will be small events here and there which the theory cannot fully explain or cannot explain at all. Please tell us how your toolkit of theories and Mearsheimer's lighting up most of the room analogy fit together. <clears throat> and question six is, based on the question above, please give us examples of when you would use realism to analyze climate politics, when you'd use liberalism to analyze climate politics, and when you'd use ideational theories to analyze climate politics. What conditions made you choose a theory in each case? Very, very good question. Um, uh, now, first, let me say that John Mearsheimer is a good friend of mine, um, and we have, we uh, you may be surprised at that since we always disagree uh, in in print. Uh, but I think he's a, a very in interesting mind, and it's uh, it's always uh, a challenge to uh, debate with him. But to me, the most important thing to remember about theory, which is consistent with what Mearsheimer said and what is quoted, is that it's always conditional. Um, it always depends on what set, what conditions you're talking about. Uh, you, you don't apply a theory to everything necessarily. You apply it under certain conditions. So in power and interdependence, Joseph Nye and I developed ideal types of complex interdependence and realism. These are crucially different since under realist conditions, force is usable. Under complex interdependence, it is not. Relations among democracies have looked like complex interdependence since the end of World War II, relations among democracies. Relations between the Soviet Union and the West were never complex interdependence, always realist. Globally, world politics looked a lot like complex interdependence uh, between 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed and the early, early 2000s when Russia reacted to the increasing independence of its former satellite states and China began to assert itself politically. So it's always, it's all, the most important thing to remember is 
you're going to understand the responses, energy responses to the Ukraine war. Realism is extremely important because it's a geostrategic situation, which was tied up with war and peace issues. Um, why does the U.S. defer to the Gulf states and let the uh, UAE chair COP28? You can't, how to explain that on complex inter interdependence grounds? It's much easier to explain it in the terms of U.S. desire to get, to get strategic, uh, to be on uh, uh, the same strategic side with the major Gulf states. Uh, that's so use realism when climate politics intersects with geopolitics. Uh, but use liberalism when you want to ask, <clears throat> why are the US and Europe the leaders in climate politics? Why do the US and Europe play the major role in international organizations? For that, you have to understand their domestic politics. You have to understand the, their patterns of complex interdependence with each other. You have to understand the role of, of democratic politics in international politics. And thirdly, use ideational theory when you want to explain the predominance of young people in democracies in climate demonstrations, why are climate demonstrations in the West led by young people? Well, I don't think either realism or liberalism explains that very well, uh, but it explained a lot better by ideational theories to understand how the how different generations have different views of the world. So that's a very good question, but basically. Always ask yourself, uh, when, it, when you ask yourself what theory to apply, think about the conditions that the theory specifies to make it important. And then to see which of the, which of the real conditions in the world is closest to those conditions. Okay, that's all I had to say. And I wanted